would now like to introduce Brian Knight presenting ingress and egress filtering for service provider edge ports. Brian heads the engineering time team at Nitel. Did I say that right? Okay. Which is a business telecom provider. His team operates a service provider network along with SD-WAN and firewall services. This is Brian's second time presenting at Nanoc, and we are certainly happy to have him speaking with us today. Welcome, Brian. Sounds good. All right. Thank you all for coming and, and uh, for staying uh, for uh, the final talk of the day. Uh, uh, I know that. Uh, uh, <clears throat> Excuse me. <laughs> um, I'm going to be giving a talk about ingress and egress filtering uh, at the Internet Edge uh, for service provider networks today. Uh, I've only got 30 minutes, so uh, let's get right to it. Uh, who am I? Uh, my name is Brian Knight. Uh, I'm engineering director over at NITEL, uh, AS53828, based out of Chicago. Uh, I've been slinging packets for 25 years. Um, uh, we do, uh, uh, at, at 53828, we do business eyeballs. Uh, Internet DIA and PLS VPNs, uh, Layer 2 Ethernet and SD-WAN. Um, there's my email and my LinkedIn, so, uh, so you can check out my profile. So in this talk, I want to discuss uh, how, what was our motivation for doing this project? Uh, what were the key decisions uh, that we made? Uh, I'll dig into a few select uh, packet forwarding scenarios. Um, I'll talk about how we implemented uh, the filtering. I'll talk about what we saw when we implemented the filtering uh, and, and tested the filtering. Uh, and then finally, a short list of recommendations. Um, I, I'm sorry, Casey. Uh, I might butcher your name. I'm, I'm sorry. Um, Casey Decchio's uh, DSAV team uh, from Brigham Young University in October of 2020 notified us of DNS spoofing vulnerabilities for uh, the DNS servers that we operate uh, for our customers. And their team was measuring vulnerability to DNS amplification attacks. Uh, so when we got this email, we found that, in fact, uh, DNS spoofing was possible mainly because we had no anti-spoofing uh, enabled on our network edge ports. Um, uh, 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 we did a quick Google search, of course, and we could not find an easy how-to for how to configure that anti-spoofing uh, on a service provider network. Um, so I. Uh, I did what, uh, what I often do is I posted to Nanog and, and posed the question to, uh, to the community. And we found that many eyeball networks uh, in the Nanog community did, in fact, do ingress filtering. Uh, they would also do, uh, 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 they performed egress filtering. Um, they would also block invalid IPs, so they would do ballgun filtering. Uh, they would block invalid ports as well, so um, ports such as NetBIOS, um, uh, Microsoft File Sharing, uh, Sun RPC, uh, and they would also block traffic uh, to critical infrastructure such as router loopback IPs and uh, internal point-to-point -point subnets. But even with this guidance, we still tr struggled to find a clear how-to uh, and template uh, on, on how to implement this. And, and that's what this presentation strives to be. It strives to be a, a, a template for this. So one of the first resources uh, that the community recommended was BCP84. Uh, the title of that BCP is Ingress Filtering for Multi-Home Networks. Perfect for what we were looking for. Uh, it outlines five techniques for anti-spoofing measures. Um, uh, those, those five techniques really boil down to uh, a static uh, access control list placed on edge interfaces versus unicast reverse path forwarding checks. Uh, BCP84 has the same overarching goal as BCP38. BCP38 has been widely uh, uh, socialized within the community, um, uh, but BCP38 mainly deals with filtering um, uh, traffic from single home sites into the service provider network. So these are service provider customers sending traffic back in. Um, BCP84's audience, however, uh, includes any multi-home network. Um, so it's perfect for a service provider network because it is, it, it, they're typically widely multi-homed. Um, BCP84 deals mainly with security at the data plane. So Please don't throw out your, your route maps and your prefix lists. You still need those at the control plane. Not that anybody here would. 
but <laughs> please don't throw those out. So going into some of the decisions that we made, um, as we looked at BCP84, it's ACLs really seem to be the only way. Uh, we looked at, uh, I mentioned uh, a moment ago uh, that it has five anti-spoofing techniques. Uh, so uh, I'll run through those uh, real quick. Um, it it, it uh, talks about uh, loose reverse path forwarding. Uh, loose, re re loose RPF uh, says that if a route exists within the routing table, accept the packet, uh, regardless of what interface it comes on. Uh, that we felt had too little granularity. We wanted to make sure that if uh, a packet is accepted, we wanted to make sure that there was a valid route going back to it, not just a, a, an existing route. Um, so we rejected that. Um, there's a degenerate case where uh, loose RPF will ignore the default route. Uh, so uh, again, that isn't going to work for our case. Uh, strict RPF, on the other hand, uh, takes us in the other direction and says, if the route exists in the rib and the packet came from the best destination interface, then accept the packet. Um, that would be fine except for uh, when that, when the route or, or when the packet arrives on an interface and it happens not to be the best path at that moment, uh, there's, there's a risk then that the packet would be dropped. So that was too strict. Feasible RPF is the, uh, the fifth uh, technique that's discussed. If the route exists in the rib and the packet comes in on any valid destination interface, then accept the packet. So in other words, if my BGP route for a prefix uh, is received on multiple interfaces, even though my router is only going to install one path in the forwarding information base, the FIB, inbound traffic would still be permitted on both paths. That seems perfect for our application, except for it didn't seem to be an option on iOS XR. So uh, we decided on static ACLs. Uh, in terms of uh, what to drop, we decided that we were going to uh, follow as many of the NANOG recommendations as we could. Uh, we wanted to block invalid traffic on egress as well as ingress. Um, we wanted to block bug on traffic in and out. Uh, we wanted to block multicast traffic as well. Um, any invalid services or ports uh, should also be blocked. And initially we focused on UDP and TCP uh, port zero and port 445. And then finally, infrastructure. Uh, we said that except for ICMP and traceroute, nothing should be permitted to hit our router loopbacks or internal point-to-point -point links from outside uh, our network. So for us, uh, being a smaller ISP, ease of, ease of administration was key. We said that the implementation should be the same on every device. So, what that meant for us was we wanted to implement the same set of ACLs configured the exact same way on all of our edge routers. And we wanted to, not only that, we wanted to use the same object groups even and have the object groups have exactly the same prefixes on every router. That way we could deploy a change and have it consistently deployed across the entire fleet. So I don't have time to go through every packet forwarding scenario and I'm not going to, um, I, I, I simply don't have the time for it, but uh, I do wanna call out a couple of, uh, of key ones. So uh, in this scenario, um, we have a packet coming in from, uh, from one of our upstreams uh, sent, uh, sent from someone out on the internet uh, and the source IP is, uh, it, uh, is one of the networks that we ourselves originate uh, in this example. So um, the, the service provider network um, originates 192.0.2.0 slash 24, uh, packet has uh, 192.0.2.1. We wanna make sure that that would, be, uh, that, that would be blocked on ingress. However, for customers where we uh, would disaggregate some of our own space, and assign it to them uh, to announce to another provider. Um, and you'll see in the corner uh, where I have uh, AS6449 originated networks. Um, 
uh, assuming for the moment that you could uh, announce a slash 29 to the larger internet and not uh, not be blocked by uh, by uh, a prefix list. What I have here is a packet originating from 203.0.1.113.100, uh, which falls within the originated networks um, uh, coming uh, that were assigned to 64499. And that packet is traversing their other provider coming through uh, the, uh, one of the service provider networks upstreams, coming back into the SP network. And we, we want to permit this because if that link uh, to, the, uh, to the service provider network, we still want to be able to offer services uh, to that customer, even though their connection to us may be down. So we made a choice to permit that traffic. Just one other scenario, um, on egress, um, we have the, uh, with a, uh, the customer, uh, again, running BGP. They're originating some traffic uh, that isn't, um, um, isn't part of their network set. So they would send a packet uh, with some bogus address. Normally, our prefix lists to that customer should catch that traffic and block it. But in case it doesn't, in case of misconfiguration, we now have another layer of uh, protection against that, um, that customer being able to send that traffic outside of our own uh, AS. So in terms of implementation, um, th this is exactly what we did. Um, we, we, we implemented what we decided, which was uh, we wanted the static ACL approach. Uh, we configured the, the four ACLs, inbound and outbound, for v4 and v6, uh, made sure to configure the object groups, and uh, we achieved the goal of making the content the same across all of the routers. So I wanted to walk through some of the object groups that we set up. Uh, the, uh, the first three groups, um, uh, the X group, peer WAN, and TRAN WAN, those all contain the directly connected subnets. So uh, for the X, for example, uh, it would be the slash 24 or slash 23 um, put, into that, uh, uh, put into that object group and, and then reference in the ACL. Um, for peer and, and, uh, and TRAN WAN, uh, as you can see, it's the, the slash 30s or slash 126s. For the, uh, uh, the IPv4 CUST, um, those were our customer uh, provider independent and provider, uh, 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 provider assigned prefixes. So anything that a BGP customer um, might, uh, might use and might uh, send out on our, uh, <clears throat> on the, uh, uh, across their backup WAN connection, uh, we want to make sure to, that that traffic is then permitted inbound. Uh, IPv4 and IPv6 bogon, uh, those are the list of invalid prefixes. Uh, IPv4 infra, uh, that's all of our router loopbacks and point to points that we wanted to specifically uh, protect uh, against outside attacks. Uh, and then uh, BGP-AG, those are the, uh, the prefixes that we would have configured in our, um, uh, in our uh, network statements uh, in BGP on all of our routers. And then uh, the last group is, uh, is an interesting one. Um, Backdoor host were, uh, was created for possibly valid traffic uh, that was uh, observed during implementation. I'll get into that in, in just a little bit. Uh, with the, uh, uh, in the observation section. And there are four static ACLs, uh, uh, PV4, INET in, INET out, and then V6 in, and V6 out. In broad strokes, this is what the ACL looks like. This is the intent of the ACL. The, the very first uh, part of it is we're going to block the invalid um, prefixes. The, uh, uh, the address space that's, that should never be used on the internet. Uh, the, uh, next, we're going to block the invalid ports. Then we're going to permit all of the traffic to and from those uh, transit X and peering directly connected networks. Then we deny multicast. 
Next, we permit where the source is BGP customer IP space. So this is where that, uh, that path from the customer's uh, backup connection or primary connection uh, can come back into, the, in, into our network to be able to use services. Uh, next, we deny where source equals aggregate IP space. So this is our, that's our anti-spoofing rule. Uh, and then next, we permit any traffic where the destination is our aggregate or our customer's IP space, and then deny any, any at the end. Uh, on the egress side, it looks very similar. Uh, we start out uh, same way, denying bog on IPs, denying invalid ports. Uh, we permit all traffic on the directly connected networks, deny multicast. We then permit where destination equals customer IP space. It may seem a little bit odd, but, uh, and, and it is. Um, what this does is it covers a strange behavior that we uncovered during testing. And uh, I'll get into that uh, when we get into the observation section. Uh, next, we permit where the source is a NITEL aggregate and customer IP space that lets valid traffic out and then deny any any at the end. So our plan was to create the initial ACLs uh, and apply them to, to our ports. Um, we enabled blocking for bog on ports immediate, or bog on prefixes immediately. Um, but where rules were intended to be deny, we made them permit and log entries uh, for the testing period so that we didn't accidentally block anything that was uh, bona fide traffic. Uh, and then our plan was to analyze the logs for the matching traffic. Uh, and we would go, then go through a cycle of refining that ACL until finally unwanted traffic uh, only on when, <clears throat> excuse me, only unwanted traffic was being logged, and then we would switch that uh, that permit to deny. So during our traffic review, um, oh, we uh, we took the took the logs, we processed them into a big CSV file, dumped it into Excel, uh, created a pivot table to summarize and view the data, cross reference that with our systems. Uh, and what we saw uh, was that uh, uh, for bog on prefixes, uh, there were no surprises there. Uh, everything um, uh, that we saw that was logged appeared to be uh, traffic that was unwanted. On the invalid port side, we saw that um, port zero, uh, initially we saw uh, a lot of random traffic uh, and we, um, as we dug into it, we found that iOS XR actually logs fragments with port zero uh, because the router doesn't have necessarily the full um, uh, layer four information. So it defaults to port zero. <laughs> so we saw, we saw this long list of, uh, of ports and we're like, what in the, what in the world was this? Um, and it, we came to find out that it was actually um, ICMP fragments. So. Uh, we added a specific rule to block those uh, ICMP fragments silently, uh, and that noise uh, uh, went way down. Uh, once, once that noise went down, uh, we saw plenty of scanning and abuse. Uh, no real traffic was observed. Uh, and, and many network tools just don't even permit the, the use of port zero. Um, but, but we did see that traffic. Um, for port 445, <laughs> We did observe traffic that uh, appeared to be bona fide. We found a customer using it uh, between several of their sites. Um, and they had been sending that traffic out, uh, out of our own uh, uh, network to internet destinations. Um, it did appear to be bona fide. Um, we decided to abandon it uh, in case that traffic truly was, um, truly was legitimate. So we, um, in the current state, the uh, invalid port ACL only blocks port zero. The infrastructure side, um, a lot of abuse hit our infrastructure. Uh, it was all different ports. Um, none of it was valid traffic, except for that IPsec tunnel terminating to an old concentrator. Fortunately, we found that the hard way. Uh, but fortunately, we were able to find that and uh, uh, rectify that problem very quickly. So as we analyze the traffic, we found many um, 
what I call MPLS VPN IPs coming in, coming back in via our transits. Um, these are IPs that we assign to our MPLS customers. Um, this is, they're, uh, they're globally unique, but they should never be routed across the public internet. Yet we were seeing that traffic come back into our AS. So uh, our theory was that these customers uh, likely didn't have firewalls, uh, or likely had firewalls. <laughs> I hope they have firewalls. <laughs> that uh, they didn't net for the globally unique IPs. Um, so all of that traffic, uh, never, uh, they, they were, um, there were TCP sessions that were trying to be set up. Uh, they were obviously weren't completing. So uh, we didn't do anything uh, special for those. We, we chose to, to block those. Uh, on the inbound uh, anti-spoofing side, uh, I mentioned earlier the, uh, the backdoor uh, routing, uh, the, the backdoor object group. And this is, this is where it comes into play. Uh, we did find a few internet WAN IPs uh, with, um, with that backdoor routing, where they were coming back into our AES uh, from outside. Um, and those, interestingly enough, seemed to be working. Um, so in the interest of not breaking things, um, those were explicitly permitted. Uh, they have their, their, uh, the object group that I talked about earlier, and they have an entry in the ACL. Um, the, on the catch-all-deny rule, uh, we didn't see any significant traffic. On the outbound side, um, we saw where... Um, we were trying to send uh, a lot of traffic uh, from other carriers, MPLS VRFs, where the WAN IP wasn't assigned to us. So uh, one thing that, uh, uh, that, that used to be very common on our network was uh, we would buy a handful of, uh, of VRFs, or, or a handful of circuits from another provider, uh, and then we would take their MPLS network and then connect it to our uh, global internet VRF. Well, a lot of these other carriers would assign their own WAN IPs. So in some cases, we had routers that were trying to connect outbound uh, to the internet uh, using that WAN IP that, that, had, that the other carrier had assigned. Now, of course, it could, couldn't communicate. Um, we also saw lots of other backdoor connections where uh, the customer router uh, would receive traffic on, on another uh, provider's WAN IP, and then the reply would be sent through us. Uh, and, and both of these types of traffic, or both of these types of uh, situations, we didn't see any uh, any valid traffic, so those were blocked. So this is a really uh, a, a, this was a, the most interesting case uh, to me uh, as, as I was digging into this. We had a situation where BGP customers would send traffic from their AS, they would use the other provider to send the traffic up to a, a content provider. But that reply to the, from the content provider would come back to us through, through some routing policy. Uh, I, I hadn't worked out exactly how this could have happened, but the traffic, the reply traffic, would be routed across the ICS to us, and then we would route that traffic right back out to one of our transit providers to go back to the customer. So as you're implementing this, uh, if you implement this on your network, you can't assume that BGP cu customer traffic will be routed to them uh, directly through you. Um, they, it might touch your network before it, it, it's, routed, uh, it's routed back out of your network and then comes to them through that alternate path. Um, on the administrative side, um, uh, the new ACL, uh, of course, carried uh, process and procedure implications. Um, any new BGP customer uh, must have their prefixes added to the, um, to the relevant object groups on, on all routers. Uh, any new aggregate blocks um, that, uh, th that you purchase, uh, they need to be added to the, uh, to the aggregate groups. And uh, one, one thing that was, that was a, a, a difficult shift for us was if a customer calls in with an issue where traffic is not getting through, um, we, may, we might need to look at those filters. Uh, it, it could be that that traffic is being dropped at your edge. Um, but fortunately, in practice, this has not cost us that much in terms of, of admin, ad, admin time. 
Um, we had uh, two issues with this since implementation, uh, and, and both of them were resolved very quickly. Um, and uh, lastly, after implementation, uh, we checked back with the DSAV team, and they showed we were no longer vulnerable to that spoof DNS traffic. So a uh, quick set of recommendations. Uh, agree internally what you plan to block. Um, get all the stakeholders involved early and communicate often. Uh, and test, 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 and test some more. Um, start with the rules uh, that permit, uh, start with the, the changing the deny rules over to permit and, and log those. And run down, make sure you just run down everything in your logs before you switch those rules to deny. Uh, shouldn't be any surprises here. A um, little bit of future work. Um, we're looking at doing some automation of the uh, object group management. We're looking at doing further security analysis and uh, lockdown of the point-to-point -point subnets. Uh, right now, uh, these are open wide from any subnet to the slash 30 or, or slash 126. Um, a better practice might be to block all unnecessary protocols. Um, so that might be an area of uh, a future work. Uh, and further characterization of the infrastructure subnets, um, deciding what we want to uh, what, we, what specifically um, we want to block is, is this blocking enough? Should we be doing more? And uh, that is, uh, that's all I have. Um, I do want to stress in the, uh, the appendix of this uh, slideshow, I do have an example of some of the object groups that we set up. So this is, um, this is a sample of what we've actually configured on the routers. Um, and uh, uh, a sample of the access list. These, these are actually the access lists that, uh, that we've deployed. And then at the very end, uh, there's a short list of references. And with that, I'll take your questions. All right, we do have a few questions um, on the virtual platform. Avi Friedman asks, was there any concern about volume of ACL deny locking on CPU, and was there any impact seen? Um, there was a concern uh, with the way that the ACL is structured. Certainly, um, uh, we did have a concern. Uh, we did look at uh, the uh, the capability of our hardware. We run um, uh, ASR uh, 9900 routers, um, and those uh, seem to have more than enough capacity. So uh, it was something that we looked at, and um, uh, fortunately, it hasn't been a problem. Okay, still so in person. I've got another question for you here from Matthew P. Tech. He says, "Good talk, Brian." If you blocked all port equals zero traffic, does that imply you blocked inbound fragments that could legitimately be destined for your customers? Did that generate many customer complaints? Um, it did block fragments, uh, and that has not generated any customer complaints to date. Awesome. And one more from virtual. Tony Tauber asks, I'm not positive that I followed it all correctly, but if the same broad inbound ACL forcing source within your address space does that mean a customer could spoof another address within that same space, e.g. assigned to another customer? Yes, there is that risk. Okay. Yes, absolutely. Um, we, we regarded that risk as um, low to medium. Uh, our, our real goal was to, was to block the, the majority of the noise. Uh, and and uh, you're, you're absolutely correct, uh, and that could be an area for future work. Yep. Anybody else have any questions here? Thank you for your time, Brian. All right. Thank we'll you so much. Grab the notes again. <laughs>